I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I have returned. Those words ring out in 20th century American history. MacArthur, General MacArthur, speaking, I have returned when he waded ashore at the Philippines. But where at the Philippines? What were the conditions around him? You see a photograph of the general and his aides and some uh, bodyguards wading through the surf. Behind them are men watching from landing craft. Where are they? What is this battle? It's Leyte, L-E-Y-T-E, 1944. A new book, Leyte, The Soldier's Battle. Nathan prefers the author, and Nathan tells the story of what was in front of General MacArthur wearing his textbook sunglasses with his cap on and waiting very carefully, getting his trousers wet because they couldn't find a landing zone. And in front of him was a battle that turns out to be the last hurrah of the Japanese Imperial Army. This battle from October of, of 1944 all the way into the spring or late winter of 1945 is the final destruction of the Japanese uh, Army and Navy at the same time so that what follows the uh, moving against the Japanese mainland and using eventually the atomic weapons that is anticlimax. That's the inability of the Japanese to surrender or find a way to say enough and negotiate terms that would have left something standing in the home islands. Nathan, a very good evening to you. Congratulations. Let's look as Marshal commanding the armies, as King commanding the navies, Ernest King, and also especially as MacArthur and his uh, command in the Pacific saw in the middle of 1944. It's the summer of 1944. And FDR flies out to Hawaii, gathers all his main commanders, including Chester Nimitz, together. And they have a debate in front of them, moving towards Japan to close on the uh, the home islands. They have Formosa is a possibility. China's a possibility to take China, to take Formosa, or to take the Philippines to launch aircraft against Japan. How do they choose the Philippines? Why do they prefer the Philippines? Good evening to you. Good evening, John. Uh, The main reason they chose the Philippines was because both Formosa and China were uncertain territories for them. They would need a much larger logistical base, a much larger attack force than they would in the Philippines. And certainly one of the main reasons that they eventually chose it was simply MacArthur's eloquence in convincing them that he, and the United States, by the way, had to return to the Philippines to keep his original promise to them. He simply convinced them that the Philippines would be the easier and more effective route. The easier, more effective route. Now, you will all recall General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, the son of a man who won the Medal of Honor uh, in uh, the Civil War, Chester, uh, Chester MacArthur, Arthur MacArthur, and Douglas MacArthur wins the Medal of Honor as well. But he wins it for a very peculiar battle, the retreat from Corregidor and Bataan, in 1941, the Japanese overrun the Philippines right away. Right after Pearl Harbor, they land in Lausanne, in the northern island where Manila is, and they advance on Manila, force MacArthur and his Philippine army, because he at that time is the commander in chief, is the field marshal of the Philippine army, having retired from the U.S. Army. They force him into the Bataan Peninsula, then eventually on on Corregidor. The President of the United States orders MacArthur to retreat on PT boats from the Corregidor, leaving behind the Philippine Army and the 4th Marines, by the way, are left behind as well. They surrender, the only Marine unit ever to surrender in mass. They are badly treated, uh, butchered, and then eventually starved to death on the Bataan Death March. MacArthur is given a Medal of Honor for retreating from his forces. He goes to Australia and leads the march back, island hopping, 1942, 1943, and 1944. We're now in the middle of 1944. So, Nathan, I ask you to settle something that has been debated now for 60 years. Did we go to the Philippines to restore MacArthur's honor? Is that why he forced his eloquence on the President of the United States, Ernest King, and uh, Marshall? That's certainly one of the reasons. The other reason was simply that what many people don't realize is that the United States didn't have all the power they really wanted for places like Formosa or the coast of China. Mm -hmm. So there was valid reasons to uh, land on the Philippines, 
to use that as a base for the eventual invasion of Japan. However, there were other options which probably could have been considered more seriously had not MacArthur worked against it. In other words, we could have bypassed the Philippines and yes, marched exactly. on, on the mainland. In now fact, the, originally, the, excuse me, originally the Navy uh, recommended that we bypass the Philippines, and they were eventually overruled by President Roosevelt. Uh, the Navy, read Ernest King, uh, commander-in-chief right. of the navies, a man who at the end of the war, when asked to write the story of his victory, said, we won and left the room. This is a <laughs> very short, very short-spoken, very eloquent man, Ernest King. And he, he suffered Douglas MacArthur. So did Chester Nimitz Douglas, uh, suffer Douglas MacArthur. Let's look at MacArthur before we plunge into the battle and the landings in October of 1944. MacArthur, at this time, you list some of his uh, attributes. He's arrogant. He's petty. He's petty. He's paranoid. He never forgets a slight. He only thinks of himself. His press operation is second to none. What can you say bad about him, Nathan? Uh, not much. <laughs> he was, in fact, a, a, a good general. He wasn't a great general. He was a good general who knew how to fight his battles. But he had his, I guess his personality was his worst enemy, his own worst enemy. Uh, he made a lot of enemies. A lot of people thought he was nothing. In fact, several high-ranking uh, United States officers used to refer to him as a prima donna. And, in fact, he acted like it in many cases. Um, he could not get over the fact that he lost the Philippines originally. He was so convinced that it was the fault of President Roosevelt. And he, blamed the Navy, he blamed the Navy. He blamed British, the British. He, he blamed, blamed the Dutch. <laughs> yes, he blamed everybody. I think he blamed Manila for a while. He blamed the bombers. He blamed everything. Every, what, everybody but himself. And please review, all of you, the facts about how MacArthur didn't respond after the first day of air attacks. He didn't... Oh, well, all right, fine. Let's come up to... Uh, it's October 20th, 1944, and the landings are about to go off uh, pretty much as designed against the eastern shore of Leyte. Now, Leyte is not a big... It's a big island in in, in uh, landmass, but it's not heavily populated. I don't think there are a million people on board. And the originally, on October 20th, the Japanese did not have a big force there. What did you say? About 21,000? Well, they had one understrength division, right, with about 21,000 men. And this division had been in the Philippines on garrison duty for two or three years now. So they were not really prepared... The commander, however, for the for, for the Fourteenth Army, Fourteenth Area Army, the Japanese commander, he's significant in that he was not a politically popular person. Yamashita, Tomoyuki Tom, Yamashita. What do we need to know about his ability to fight? On, in contrast to General MacArthur, he had won all his battles in his career. Uh, unfortunately, he was not politically in favor. And he was the one that conquered Malaya and Singapore earlier in the war. Right. He took the and surrender of 100,000 British, uh, outnumbering his army at Singapore, breaking, uh, Roosevelt, uh, breaking Churchill's promise to Roosevelt that Singapore would stand. That's correct. And his reward was to be exiled to uh, Manchuria. Uh, it was only when the Japanese needed really good commanders, in the case of the Philippines, that he was at the last minute transferred to the Philippines to take command of that uh, that area. In fact, he only arrived a month before the landing. When we come back, uh, 10 Corps and 24 Corps will land on the beaches, 20 October 1944. The ambition here is to take Lady and launch on Luzon to the north, the main island. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. I'm speaking to Nathan Prefer, who has written Leyte, 1944, The Soldier's Battle. This is the land battle that settled the Japanese Imperial Army. The facts are that originally it was one understrength division, as Nathan reports, but Japan had a way of fantasizing that there was always going to be a final battle. 
And 20 October 1944, the landings are successful. The Japanese have retreated from their original idea of defeating the Americans at the beaches. They hadn't been successful at Guam, then been successful at Tarawa. They're a front, in front of us, of course, are Iwo Jima and Okinawa. That will be the massacres, the, the grinding down of what is left of those islands in 1945. But the landings go off very successfully on the first day. Let's get MacArthur on board. Uh, and landed. Red Beach, that is not without combat, uh, Nathan. How do the Japanese resist on Red Beach? They have built, uh, recently built, uh, the usual defenses, pillboxes, caves, tank traps, and they have moved up some artillery to what they fear would be the landing beaches. And in fact, in this case, they are correct. They, um, they do offer some resistance. There are uh, some casualties. And uh, MacArthur comes ashore within a few hours of the initial landings onto Red Beach, which was one of the more contested beaches. Right. You nobody, have... have, nobody ever criticized his, courage, his personal courage. No, there were still snipers in the area. And, right. our, uh, and Ch- uh, Nathan has done the very careful work of putting together combat reports from the units along with the citations of the Medal of Honors. And I want to note one amazing fact. We always presume that the Japanese-Americans were used, and uh, Senator Inouye, recently deceased, was part of the Japanese-American unit that fought in Italy. The understanding was that we couldn't tell between Japanese and Japanese-Americans if they fought in the Pacific. But you cite Captain Francis B. Way, uh, from uh, in the 34th Infantry. He was in headquarters company, and at Red Beach, he sees that all of the commanders around him have been wounded or are out of action, so he takes control of that attack and successfully overwhelms the Japanese resistance, a Japanese-American. Yes, he was actually from Hawaii. I believe he was a regular Army officer and uh, a staff officer, so he wouldn't be confused if, he, you know, if there was combat, direct combat with the Japanese. But when he saw that this, this situation needed some leadership, he stepped forward and, and basically moved them off the beach uh, at the co- eventually the cost of his own life. Right. He led an assault against an enemy pillbox holding up the advance that Captain Way was struck at, and Captain Way was struck down by enemy fire. And he's a number of the posthumous medals of honor in uh, Nathan's book. He's put this together. There are a whole lot of uh, PFCs who also leave lead one-man actions to break uh, through the Japanese. I want to underline here, Nathan, the Japanese had a vision of what they were going to do. They were going to draw the Americans into this battle. But initially, they didn't have enough men on the island. When did they realize that the Americans had landed in force? When did they decide to uh, to reinforce themselves? Well, what actually happened was they were planning the the main battle to be on Luzon. And they had basically written Leyte off originally until the Americans landed. Within a day or two, Imperial General Headquarters in in Tokyo was ordering General Yamashita to transfer his main forces to Leyte to make that the decisive battle that they were looking for, which really put the Japanese at a disadvantage because they weren't prepared to do that. They had to reinforce with units from other islands in the Philippines, and I think they eventually brought the 1st Division all the way from Manchuria. So they were bringing all their best units in. They'd put a number of 50,000 men here, 50,000 men there. There were close to, uh, my notes are, I think, 80,000 on Luzon and only 21,000. So they were reinforcing from the west coast of Leyte. Did the Americans have control of the west coast of Leyte at this time, or was that a mixed area between the two fleets? No, that was, that was a, a disputed area. Basically, the Americans could move on the, along the west coast during the day, and the Japanese could control it at night. Um, it was a lot like Guadalcanal in the early days of the war, when, you know, Americans had it during the day and the Japanese controlled it at night. So they could move relatively large numbers of troops ashore as long as they did it at night or early in the morning. What is, stri- Amer- what is striking about your telling, Nathan, is that you filled in a story I never understood. October 20th, the landings, and the first three days, the 24th Division uh, the, uh, and other divisions, 10 Corps and 24 Corps, they have a 10-mile gap between them that they're going to close, move very sprightly into the valleys. However, there's a there's gathering storm at sea because the Japanese Imperial Navy plans to use this landing uh, 
uh, to as bait? How did they see it? They were going to draw the American fleet into this. How did they understand uh, how they were going to use Leyte? This is the Navy. Right. Well, the, the, again, Imperial Japanese headquarters wanted the decisive battle to be at Leyte. They had changed their mind at the last minute. So they had ordered not only the Army to reinforce Leyte, but the Navy to uh, attack the American fleet, which was tied to the Leyte landings. They knew they couldn't run. They had to stay there and defend the beaches. So they knew they had a sitting target, basically, and they thought that they could wipe them out. Unfortunately for the Japanese, it didn't turn out that way. It was a huge sea battle, however. It happens uh, the 23rd, 24th, 25th, and 26th, so within the first week of the Leyte landings. And the Japanese had a a very sophisticated attack. They struck from the south coming from the west of Leyte, and they had a force coming from the north circling through this passage to strike to, uh, to strike against Halsey's force from the north. And Halsey took the bait and chased the Japanese to the north. He pulled his carriers away from Leyte, and the Japanese successfully slipped through their southern force, and but for the actions of the American fleet, not with, they didn't have any carriers, they just mostly had gunships. They stopped the Japanese at Lady Gulf. Otherwise, the trap would have worked. We came very close to losing that, Nathan, my reading of the map. That's, you're correct. Uh, had the Japanese followed through with their plan as it was originally written, it might have been much more successful. Now, the, they, pus- the puzzle here, Nathan, did the Japanese have good information about how many men we had landed? Did they have understanding of how no. big our resources were? No, they habitually underestimated our resources, both in the fleet and on the, in the ground forces. Um, they always thought we had less troops on the ground, and they, they actually believed their own inflated figures of American losses. They would report after a fleet action or a combat at sea that, we, that they had sunk so many ships. And they been, began to believe it when, in fact, the participants knew that was not true. So the- they based a lot of their intelligence estimates on false facts. After they lose or do not win the Battle of Lady Gulf, we're now the 25th, 26th, the challenge now is to whether they reinforce their forces on Lady or whether they pull them off. What was their decision? Their decision was to send as many troops to Leyte as they could. Uh, They still wanted what they called a decisive ground battle to defeat the American army. Um, They even had plans to uh, organize MacArthur's surrender on Leyte at one point. Um... And so they, they drew troops, as you mentioned, from as far away as Manchuria to send into Leyte at night and uh, basically wipe out the 6th United States Army. In other words, having convinced themselves they could draw the American fleet, Chester Nimitz's fleet, Nimitz controlled everything back from Pearl Harbor, having yeah. convinced themselves that they could draw Nimitz's fleet uh, into this decisive battle and it didn't work out, they've now convinced themselves that they can draw MacArthur into the decisive battle and capture him and force the Americans to negotiate at, at, the, t- at, at the peace table. That was, the, that was the assumption of the Japanese dictatorship back in Tokyo and the assumption of Yamashita and the Southern Army. This is a vast complex of men who are going to be drawn now into the hills and valleys of Leyte. When we come back, we'll plunge in to the island because the Americans are going to surround the Japanese and destroy them. Leyte... 1944, The Soldier's Battle. Nathan prefers the author. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Nathan Prefer is here, and his book is Leyte. This is the land battle that accompanies Leyte Gulf, and this is the final destruction of the Japanese Imperial Army. It is an extremely disciplined group, inventing themselves all the time in defensive positions on Leyte. Nathan, the terrain. You describe uh, agricultural land of jungles, of swamps, of very narrow roads, some of which are hard, hard uh, strewn with, I guess, uh, seashells. Others are seasonal and rolling hills. 
the Americans uh, understood this when they landed. W- did they understand that they'd be kept at just advancing up the roads, that they couldn't use their armor, or did they learn that when they got there? They, most of that they learned when they got there. Even though the United States had been serving in the Philippines for, for decades, they didn't have very accurate maps. They didn't have a lot of history of the island. And while they knew about the more developed areas along the coast, they had absolutely no information about the inland mountain ranges, which was where most of the uh, uh, battle eventually took place. The uh, Sixth Army, the Japanese believe, is trapped on Leyte, and they're bringing in the 1st Infantry Division is the one I think General Kruger said he blames that one more than any other for extending the operations all the way till into the spring because it was so difficult to... um, to make them surrender. I want to emphasize something that I learned from you, Nathan. This is where the kamikaze started, right here, Loft Lady. Mm -hmm. The the 4th Air Army was out of equipment, out of men, out of personnel, so they converted themselves into suicides. Correct. This is the first organized kamikaze. They were individual kamikazes as far back as Pearl Harbor. But um, this was the first organized attack where the men knew from the minute they got into their planes that they were going to dive into a ship. And the oh. Americans learned in action that they it wasn't enough to shoot them down. They had to shoot them down so that they couldn't drive their ships, sometimes loaded with bombs. Some t- I, I don't think at this point you didn't indicate that any of them were loaded with TNT, the way the kamikazes were when they hit the fleet off of Okinawa and Iwo Jima. These just looked to be loaded with bombs when they, when they hit the, air, uh, uh, the, air, uh, the ships. Right. This was, again, the early stages before they got more right. sophisticated. Now, on land, the, they didn't turn into kamikazes. They'd always launch bonsais. But, right. Nathan, what was the policy here? I think at one point you say there were 15,000 killed in action at the end and seven POWs. Did the Japanese commit suicide or did, the, did, did they just attack and abandon their wounded? Why, why such a disparate number of POWs? Where were the wounded? There were no wounded. You, in the Japanese army at that time, if you were wounded and you were in a condition, in the jungle conditions, you were pretty much left on your own resources. Their medical services were very limited. They had no ambulances to speak of. Their field hospitals were set up in the middle of a jungle. Um, and if they had a retreat, they did leave you behind. You either had to crawl along after them or you had to commit Harry Carey. That was what was what was expected. Yes, there was one scene, and I don't recall exactly the unit. Nathan's book is very specific, where the Americans came across a Japanese camp that had been deserted, and they found in the caves all around the camp the Japanese wounded who were dying in horrible conditions. The Americans were appalled, even though they hated this enemy, and they did hate, and this was savage combat. That I get the picture of men who were starving to death or dying of their wounds alone. Is that what? Is, is, do I remember correctly, Nathan? Yes, you do. That, that's exactly what happened, and this was to be repeated through the battles for the rest of the war. Plunging yeah. in, plunging into Lady is there are two valleys. One is Lady Valley, and one is Ormoc Valley. We'll go into Lady Valley first because. The roads run north to south. The island is north to south, but they have to cross the central part of the island. This is volcanic uh, volcanic rock with vegetation grown up. And they have to drive to two cities interior. There's one road. It's called Highway 2, which is an exaggeration, of course. And I want to speak of the 17th Infantry. What did you tell me? This is 7th Division? That's correct. Seventh Division driving on Dagami, one of the in, one of the roads interior, one of the towns interior. These are not to call them villages is an exaggeration too, but there's one attack here that becomes like all the other attacks. This is the second battalion of the Seventeenth Infantry leading the attack on the next day into Dagami. The attack has a hundred wide mile swamp. And they attack uh, arm, uh, so, shoulder to shoulder, but they're attacking against Japanese positions that are dug in. Could they see the Japanese? How did they, how did they know where the enemy was, Nathan? They, they couldn't see them. They were hidden in the jungle, uh, and they were covered by camouflage. The Japanese had dug in. They had made pillboxes out of logs. Uh, they dug themselves into the swamps in some cases. So basically, they couldn't see them until they opened fire. And that's why the hand-to-hand combat, that's why you couldn't see, what, six feet? You could get within six feet of a person and not see him. Correct. You could even walk past him and not see him, as occurred in many instances. 
Well, Len- you, didn't know that, you didn't know that they were there until they opened fire. Leonard C. Brostrom, private first class from Preston, Idaho. The citation here is amazing. He leads his units, the 3rd Platoon. They're uh, cut off in the swamp. They can't see their next unit. They've lost contact. Uh, I picture this from left and right. And Brostrom, the wounded, leads an attack against a nearby trench. I suspect the Japanese were hidden. He charges, uh, They six enemy soldiers charge him with bayonets. He kills or, or drives them off with his own weapon. He, he's been wounded. He's dying. He Correct. throws grenades into pillboxes and then continues to lead the attack while he's lying wounded. And Nathan, when I first read this, I thought it was unusual, but Brostrom, there are lots of Brostroms in your story. The PFCs lead these charges in many instances. They're, they're officers, they can't find them. The officers are wounded. Even the sergeants, the non-coms are missing. So the PFCs, he would have been, what, 20, 21 years old? I believe he was about 20, 21 years old, correct. One of the, the situation in a jungle fighting is that you can't see more than five or six feet in any direction. So you can't see your officers and you can't see your non-commissioned officers. If you see an uh, enemy force that's threatening you, you have to take action on your own, which is what these men did. He dies October 28th, 1944. Uh, Posthumous Medal of Honor. There are a lot of them in Nathan's book, and he gets it from the citations. And so you redo the field citations. There are a number of posthumous DSCs. Some live to get their DSCs. I don't make a difference between getting a DSC in this fight and met, winning a Medal of Honor. It's often whether you have the number of officers who can vouch for your action afterwards. It's a, it's a clerical thing that is significant at the time, but there's no difference in the, from reading your text, Nathan, the men who get DSCs and the men who get Medal of Honor sacrifice the same way. I agree. It's really who writes it up. Uh, and same for the Silver Star. There was one sergeant who already had a Silver Star from another battle, and he died getting a Medal of Honor in this fight. Now, we into the valleys, they carry the Leyte Valley. But what's important here is that the Japanese report have, have re- reinforced to such an extent that General Kruger and General MacArthur, the overall commander, have to make a decision. When do they decide that they're going to surround the Japanese, that that's the only way to grind them down, Nathan? Uh, this happens in, uh, later in November when uh, they're hitting the uh, main enemy defenses in the mountains and they're not making a great deal of progress. Uh, MacArthur is putting a lot of pressure on Kruger because he wants to move on to Luzon. He wants to make his return to Manila, which is the capital of the Philippines. And so um, Kruger is, is looking around for a solution. And one of his reinforcing units is the 77th Infantry Division, um, and that unit had a history and a, tra- a lot of training in amphibious operations. So the commander of that unit, General Bruce, suggested to him that they make an uh, amphibious landing behind the main enemy forces at the Ormoc Bay, which is on the west coast. And that is eventually how they wound up surrounding the Japanese. Uh, we're going to come back and tell the Battle of Ormoc Coast. This is the 77th Infantry Division, which Nathan... And there are a lot of people listening who know what this is. This fought in France. It was part of the Lost Battalion in yes. World War I. It certainly was part of the Army Reserve Divisions in World War II. But the 77th was known as, this is a friendly show, Nathan, so I'll be very <laughs> careful here. Okay. The, old B, uh, uh, the Old B Division is what they called it. And it was very highly rated. In fact, at some time it was flattered as to being you know, almost as good as a Marine division. We'll land with the 77th on the west coast of of Leyte when we come back. The book is Leyte, 1944, The Soldier's Battle. Nathan prefers the author. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. ...through very carefully and talking about parts of the story that have not been available because the records are scattered. Nathan has pulled together a number of citations of awards, uh, medals, many of them posthumous, but also the divisions and the and the battalions reporting. Eventually, the 6th Army, which is what is fighting the Battle of, of Leyte, uh, is an enormous force. They pull in their reserves from other parts of the Pacific because they know that the Japanese have poured in new divisions as well. And the 77th Infantry Division is tasked to land on the west coast of Leyte, Ormoc Bay. 
significant here is that the landing will go straight forward, but they're carried there by destroyer escorts, destroyer transports, which are older tr- destroyers. One of them is the Ward. The reason I flagged the Ward is that it was the U- part of the U.S. Navy, the, uh, the combat unit of the U.S. Navy that first opened fire uh, at Pearl Harbor. It dropped uh, depth charges, correct me, Nathan, if I misremember this, on one of the Japanese uh, mini-subs that tried to sneak into the uh, to Wahoo and sink our fleet. Didn't it Didn't it score the first casualties against the Japanese? Yes, it did. It was, it, uh, well, we don't know if they actually hit anything, but they did drop the first depth charges on a Japanese midget sub, and they issued the first uh, warning from a ship about the uh, coming attack. And so the ward is part of this landing off of Ormok Bay. What's the plan? What did Kruger want them to do? Kruger wanted them to land behind the enemy lines at, uh, at, at the town of Ormok in Ormok Bay, which was known to be one of the uh, ports that the Japanese were using at night. He wanted the uh, Americans to land there during the day, close the port, and then cut off the Japanese supply lines while attacking them from the rear. At this point, did Kruger, did Kruger, General Kruger is commanding this, uh, the overall force now on Leyte, the 6th Army. Did Kruger understand that this was going to be a fight to the death? Did that come to them right away or did it develop? Um, it, it developed because initially the, the battle wasn't that severe when they first landed, but the increasing reports of more Japanese units landing uh, advised him eventually that he was going to be in for a very long and difficult battle. He lands the 77th. They land, uh, if I follow your story, Nathan, they land and immediately go into attack. They don't wait for their artillery. They don't wait for their armor. They're attacking right away. They're going as fast as they can to come up the coast to Ormok. And the Japanese are trying to respond to this because they've stripped their defensive forces at Ormok. They've pushed them in the interior. So from your text, I think the Japanese were surprised. Is that accurate? Yes. In fact, the Japanese were busy attacking the rest of the 6th Army on the other side of the Ormok uh, Valley. And they had very, very few troops in reserve. Uh, and even these were com- totally surprised by the landing. Uh, uh, Yamagita at the tw- uh, commands a uh, division. Makino commands a division. Suzuki commands a division. Right. Uh, Katoka commands uh, Fukuyi. Uh, command Yamashita is the overall commander. These right. individual commanders, they keep adjusting their plans. But what do they tell their men? Do they tell them they're going to fight to the death? Do, do they have meetings and saying, uh, we're not going to retreat, this is to the end? No, they're promising their men that despite all this suffering, they will be victorious in the end. And in fact, I think they believe it themselves. The Japanese they, they keep coming up with plans that are going to win the day, and they sure. launch what Nathan uh, identifies as the first and only aerial assault by the Japanese in the Pacific. Is that correct? Right. The Japanese um, had conducted an aerial, uh, aerial assault in 1941 against the Dutch, but there was no actual, there was no long-term fighting. This was the first offensive uh, airborne attack on Americans in the Pacific. It was actually the only one. And they follow, they, they, they launch this attack after they think they've been successful sending in what looked to be one-way trips, crash-landing uh, guerrillas to blow up airfields. Right. At this point, are the airfields on Leyte good? Are they using them? I, I read a couple of times where the Americans had rated them not functional. Right. Uh, Leyte was, the ground on Leyte was not good for airfields. The Japanese had built several, but they themselves had never used them. But they were convinced that the Americans were using them, even though the Americans found them to be unsuitable. So they had planned their counterattack around those airfields, hoping to destroy American air power. But in fact, the American air power was coming from other airfields outside of Leyte and off the Navy carriers. Nathan, I want to focus on the Japanese here because the Americans fight valorously and we know they are successful. Uh, Their casualty rate, and Nathan has good charts here, is very high. 15,000 casualties eventually for the 6th U.S. Army led by Walter Kruger. But when I go through my notes here, the uh, 35th Army was trapped on December 21st, completely surrounded. Uh, The Yamashita line was cracked and the 1st Division fell back. They destroyed the 26th Division entirely on the 23rd of December. Again, again, and again, the 16th Division is in pieces by that time. But the fighting drags on for another three months. 
and the Japanese fight in the interior in a single unit or cut off from each other. Why did they continue to fight? What was their understanding of what they were going to achieve once they were surrounded and starving to death? Once they, once they moved into the interior and realized they were surrounded, they really had no objective but to tie down American forces, uh, hoping to protect their homeland. And that was, the, that was the version that the officers were giving them, that their fighting there would prolong the homeland security because the American forces chasing them could not be sent to Japan. And that was how they that that was what kept up their morale. However, the uh, what I take from your book is because they'd poured so many f- so so much of their reserve force into Leyte by the end of Leyte, this is January February. Uh, Luzon is a is a relatively easy battle for MacArthur when he moves on because they've stripped their defenses there, and they take Manila pretty quickly. Although the Japanese, in revenge, in a vicious uh, uh, exit destroy Manila, massacre people there, and don't fight for it. Correct. Um, that's what happened. Yamashita was very upset, and he was very opposed to sending troops to Leyte, because his original plan was to defend Luzon for a very long time. So, when, But when he had to send his reinforcements to Leyte, he had no reserves for Luzon. And in fact, it made MacArthur's eventual landing on Luzon much easier. So what we have in Leyte is an example of the place that the Japanese... Imperial Army destroyed itself, the Japanese Imperial Navy destroyed itself, and the Japanese Imperial Air Forces uh, uh, were so out of resources they invented the kamikaze. This is the really the final battle. After this, it was the homeland preparing to die in one, what, I guess, some vision of, of, of Hades, that they were going to die together, and that comes with the atomic weapons. But it all happened in Leyte. After Leyte, there was no viable strategic challenge by the Japanese uh, military. That's correct, yes. Uh, General Kruger, your opinion. Does he get the attention he deserves today, now 60, 70 years later, for this success? No, I don't think so. Kruger um, was one of those guys who liked to work in the, in the shadow of somebody else, and MacArthur was more than willing to provide that shadow. Um, he actually conducted nearly all of MacArthur's campaigns from early days in uh, uh, New Guinea all the way through Luzon. But uh, the actual tactical maneuvers of his army were always uh, Kruger's. In fact, even the landing at Ormoc was originally approved by Kruger, who then just passed it on to MacArthur. So I think he uh, is one of those people who did a great job, but nobody seems to recognize it. He became a general having started as a PFC, so the soldiers liked him. He was considered the, the, the common soldier's general. Yes, he was. Uh, I have in the book uh, about that famous cartoonist, Bill Malden, who uh, actually served under him and was very impressed by him. Because he cared about the soldiers' feet. Uh, the story about General Kruger is that when he inspected units, he had people take their socks off to see what shape their feet were in, and he would penalize or punish non-coms or officers who had men who had uh, whose uh, feet were in poor repair because he said that's, what the, what, that's what's important, the infantry, and we have to have successful, healthy infantry to walk all day for the attacks I'm throwing them in. Of course, the sacrifice of the 6th Army is significant, and Nathan's book uh, highlights it. This is going on at the same time all of the attention is going to Europe and the rolling up of the German army, but Leyte is the battle, 1944, the soldiers' battle, that destroys the Japanese military's ability to resist. I'm John Batchelor. Nathan prefers the author. This is The John Batchelor Show.